And a good day to you, all of you, friends far and near. Greetings from First Lutheran Church in Windsor, Ontario. The Sunday we're celebrating this week is called in Latin rogate, that means pray. That's one of the most important expressions of the Christian faith. What would you say when we'd have to say about husband and wife, they're not talking to one another. Or about children and their parents, they're not talking to one another. Certainly that would be in an indication that something is terribly amiss. That certainly applies to the Christian. If people would have to say, they're not talking to God, because God is talking to us. And perhaps one thing even worse, or at least as bad as not talking, is when one of the party starts yelling. We're going to hear a story from the Old Testament today where the people of God are yelling at God. Let's consider the Word of God today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For the sixth Sunday of the Easter season, we hear the epistle from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Holy Gospel is written in the Gospel of St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The basis for our meditation on Rogata Sunday is the Old Testament lesson appointed for this day, written in the book of Numbers in chapter 21. From Mount Hor, Israel set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze servant and be healed. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds that we may understand your word, that it may lead you to faith in Christ. Amen. Amen. My friends, I have to start with a little story that I got off the internet as a report of something that happened. There was a fast food company in the city of Istanbul and they hired people, including somebody who would drive around to, to deliver the various hamburgers that people had ordered. And one of the conditions of his employment contract was that he would receive and eat one hamburger at lunch every day. But after a while, that got to be a drag for that driver, and he protested, and he was dismissed from that particular job. So he went to court, and the judge found that a hamburger every day Day after day, lunch, hamburger meat is almost an attack on human dignity and he judged that this man deserved monetary compensation. I certainly am wondering what our young people in here in the Western world, how they would react to eating hamburger. Perhaps that would cause a great deal of jubilation. Here in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, we seem to read a similar story. There had, there had been difficult times. For almost 40 years, the Israelites had to plod their way through the desert, and on the menu every day, manna, manna. Manna every day. Only occasionally there was added a little meat from quail birds. No wonder we might think that they were just fed up and they said, We loathe this worthless food, as they complained. But the Israelites did not get compensation after their complaint. The Moses did not commiserate with them and their complaints. He didn't say, you poor guys, I feel for you. On the contrary, they found out that their protests, which were really directed against God himself, would cost them dearly for some even their lives. And the proof is God is not mocked. 
Now, what are we, the people of the 21st century, members of the Christian church, going to do with an Old Testament story about the protest against the menu? Should this be our lesson? Keep your mouth shut, just keep your head down, put up with whatever God puts on your plate. Sisters and brothers, let's take a careful look at the text to find out why such a story is presented to us in the Bible. The people of Israel were on their long journey, coming out of slavery in Egypt, traversing the desert, and by now, most of the way was behind them. They were close to their goal. They would, have, would be there shortly. Soon their trials would be over. Yes, at times they took a little detour, a different route, to avoid com confrontation with the Edomites and other enemies. But soon they'd be done. But just at that point, the Israelites begin to grumble. I have to say, again. And they're not just complaining about the limited menu. They actually start complaining that God let them out of Egypt at all. They wish they were back in Egypt. Imagine, in slavery and servitude. There, they remembered, they at least had a better menu. They claim that God, by leading them into the desert, does not have their best interests at heart, and that by his plan they will, in the end, end in death. They're just fed up with the way God is leading them. They're not convinced about his loving care, even though without the manna, they wouldn't have survived even to this point. Manna saved their lives. My friends, consider this for a moment. Hearing this story, is it like looking into a mirror and seeing ourselves? You and I, we have a much greater promise, the promise of salvation. By the way, that was much more significant than what the Israelites had been told. We were granted salvation from eternal death and damnation in our baptism. Through that, the Holy Spirit called us to faith in Christ, gave us fellowship with the living God. And because of that, one would expect that our joy about this salvation would imprint itself on our daily life, that we would marvel about the fact that from our baptism on, God took us by his hand and now leads us from day to day to endless glory. On the way strengthened by the New Testament manna, Holy Communion. Now, in regard to God's gifts in our lives, we can be rather forgetful at times, right? Forgetting that we people who have been called to salvation, but so often we are dissatisfied with the things that sometimes make our life difficult and present us challenge and make us struggle. When we go to church, is it not just like last Sunday? The same elements at Holy Communion, ordinary bread and wine, nothing spectacular. The hymns we've sung quite a few times before and again this week. Sometimes it's become boring, even the drag. By the way, it's one of the great disappointments for pastors and for congregations that after their baptism, their instruction in the faith, their participation in the life and worship of the church, some of the believers that they have taught and nurtured grow tired, neglect worship, and then rarely attend the Lord's table. For them, there are so many other opportunities that seem to make life more interesting, more exciting, more fulfilling even. But this is to forget 
that we're all on the way to a common goal, admittedly, at times, facing difficulties and problems. But this is entirely short-sighted, indeed dangerous, to leave this road, to go off on a tangent and net not let God's source of power strengthen you on life's journey. And that's what the means of grace are all about, especially the sacrament of Holy Communion. And my friends, Holy Communion is not just like a hamburger, obviously. You can replace a hamburger with many other versions of fast food. But for Christians, Holy Communion is the indispensable and irreplaceable power source that our loving God has provided so that we might be nurtured for life's challenges. Not to make use of it. That's like turning away from God to seek help from something or someone else. Our Bible text tells us that the Israelites very directly came to feel the consequences of their rebellion against God and their complaint about this particular nourishment that God had granted them. We read, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Pretty terrible, isn't it? But God's judgment today can be even more terrible. For instance, when he does not stop us, when we continue to act against his will or reject him outright, when we refuse to listen to his word or despise the sacrament that Christ our Lord has instituted for our benefit, or when we search for a more exciting, more adventurous life, but do so with, without or even apart from God, then we will find nothing but death. God does not want that. He does not want us to perish, but to have everlasting life. Now, usually God does not send poisonous snakes to punish us, as he did to Israel in response to their rebellion. But he does sometimes allow things, events, situations that show us if we disregard him, that God is not mocked. That should lead us to the recognition we have sinned and cannot help ourselves. Those snakes really made life difficult in the camp and the Israelites, realizing their rebellion, didn't dare to ask God directly for redress in their problem, in their difficulty. In fact, they asked Moses to intercede in their behalf. And God's answer to that request was rather unusual. Make a bronze serpent and lift it up. There is the solution for the problem of the snakes. Look at the bronze serpent and be healed. At this point, my friends, the Old Testament story gets very New Testament-like. No, you cannot help yourself trying to persuade God, hey, I didn't mean it, I'll try to do better next time. But rather God has lifted up someone else his son, Christ Jesus, to be our savior. There he is, lifted up on the cross of Golgotha near Jerusalem on that hill. Look up, see how he suffered for you and for all who at any time were dissatisfied with the way God led them through life, who grumbled, complained, refused to follow his will. There he is on the cross of whom the beginning of the Bible foretold that the great serpent, the evil one, Satan, will bruise his heel. But above all, he, Christ, God's Messiah, will crush the serpent's head and defeat him. 
Yes, just look at the bronze servant, serpent. Moses said, some may have thought you must be kidding. What's that going to do for me, just looking up on this metal presentation? But those who took Moses at his word, or better yet, took God at his word, those who actually believed him, who took comfort in that promise, accepted that invitation, they looked on the bronze serpent and they lived. Yes, take a look. Not at anyone or anything else, but look there on the crucified Christ, now gloriously risen from the dead. He comes into our life through the message of the gospel, through the saving gift of baptism, through dispensing of his body and blood in the sacrament of the altar. So, only those who believe that the gospel of Christ is the solution to the problem of eternal death, they will be saved. Now, before any one of us begins to think, well, we're not really that bad, and everybody makes mistakes, and to err is human, and let's not be too picky. I say, think again. God knows each of us better than we know ourselves. That's why it is so helpful that God has put up a sign to look up to, so that we realize who we really are. There, Christ on the cross, the crucifix in our church, that's the sign God raised up. The cross reminds us that we are doomed sinners, but that he there offers salvation through Christ's sacrifice. For you, be, because you are a sinner in need of fixing your basic problem, Christ offered his very life on your behalf. Look up to Jesus, raised up on the cross for you. That's the solution. Believe him, rely on him. There are, of course, many and various gifts with which God enriches our lives and the lives of those around us. But none of us possess all of these gifts, which leads some people to complain to God and perhaps even be jealous of the gifts that he presented to somebody else, their neighbor. But with the spiritual gift, dispensed in Christ's church, it is different. You can indeed have them all. And which are those gifts? Hearing the gospel and responding to it, especially as you hear the liberating pronouncement of the forgiveness of your sins, or receiving holy baptism and rejoicing that you are a child of God, being nourished and strengthened in your faith by the gift of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament of the altar. Those gifts of God call us to and bring us eternal life. And you can have them all. However, we need to be reminded of one thing. Serpents will continue to be part of our lives. That is, there will continue to be difficulties, challenges, disappointments, illnesses, yes, even death, even while looking up to the crucified Christ. But none of those things can infect us with the worst of all things, eternal death and damnation. The gospel of Christ calls us to him, our Savior, and yes, it does so every day. By baptism, he made us part of his family, and with the body and blood in Holy Communion, he strengthens our faith for whatever we may face on life's journey. That's a comforting word. That's encouragement for today and for tomorrow. Take God upon it. Amen.
and the grace of the Holy Spirit leading us to Christ Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your Son has promised that if we ask, we shall receive. We know that our prayers are pleasing to you, since Christ has commanded us to pray and he promised to hear us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, protect your church from complacency, anxiety over worldly things, and fear of persecution. Give us faithful pastors and church workers who proclaim your life-giving word to us. Grant us zeal for the house of God and peace in our hearts in all our days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, soften the hearts in every home. Turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience. Banish the spirit of impudence, stubbornness, and rebellion from all. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, receive our supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all civil authorities. Give them the saving knowledge of Christ Jesus, our mediator, whose death is the ransom for all. Bless also their exercise of power for the common good, that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, in the resurrection of your Son, you showed his victory over all griefs and sorrows, having carried them to the cross, breaking their power, and winning for us life and salvation. Grant your mercy to the sick and sorrowing, the grieving and dying, especially here in our congregation. Be with all those in need of our prayers, that by your merciful aid and according to your gracious will, they may be upheld in their time of affliction, defended in their time of trial, guarded by your mighty protection, and according to your will being granted healing from their affliction or entrance into your heavenly kingdom through the power of Christ's mighty resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, the children of Israel were impatient with you and Moses, your servant. By their words, they showed their discontent with your gracious gifts. Work in us true fear of you, that we may not be destroyed in this life or the next by such sinful folly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have attended to the voice of our prayers, for you have commanded us to pray and you have promised to hear us. Let your mercy sustain us when we heartily and fervently pray to you at all times and in all places, trusting in your promise through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I now invite you to join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.